Welcome back to The Beat. We are in the midst of our special breaking coverage, and I can tell you this is one of those days where you get the phone call, you try to, in our case, learn the story, get in front of a camera, oh my gosh, he's retiring, and we've been kind of dealing with that, but at the same time, I'll tell you, our producers and journalists here on The Beat have been wanting to take a few hours today with the little time we had to present to you what we know about Justice Breyer. We heard Senator Hirono just say that she thanks him for a quarter century of work. And I want to turn now to something we put together for you on Justice Breyer's actual legacy, the substance, and also what it shows about the future and the decision facing President Biden, as well as where the high court heads. So let me start with where we're going. The Supreme Court's shift to the right is actually evident when you go across Breyer's career, because in 94, he was widely considered a moderate pick at the time acceptable to conservative Republicans. Now, keep that in mind, because in the days ahead, as we talk about replacing him, you might, hurt, you might hear people on the right saying that Breyer's too liberal or they don't want someone as, quote, liberal as him. But facts do matter. It was a long-serving Utah Republican and Judiciary Chairman, Senator Hatch, who personally recommended Breyer to President Clinton as the kind of left of center jurist that Hatch could back. It was also a shift that Republicans wanted, because if you're wondering, well, why were they brainstorming people for Clinton that might work? Well, they were actually coming off the confirmation of an even more liberal judge who had just successfully made it onto the court, Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Breyer came close to being selected last year and even came to Washington for an interview. But Aide said he didn't click with the president, who turned instead to Ruth Bader Ginsburg. One big advantage for Breyer, he is very well liked in the Senate. That proved to be true. He was well liked and respected. I walked through just some of those numbers over the years of when the very partisan Senate still was not so partisan that they couldn't put forward qualified nominees onto the court. He was confirmed 87 to 9. Then Senator Biden was in charge of those hearings. Today, the Senate Judiciary Committee welcomed Judge Stephen Breyer, the president's nominee to be Associate Justice of the Supreme Court of the United States. In each of the uh, confirmation hearings that I've had the privilege to chair, I've tried to look at the broader issues at stake when we confirm a nominee to the court to consider the values by which our nation defines and redefines itself over time and the means by which government can best express and defend those values. So we welcome you to, here today, Judge, not merely to measure your competence to sit on the court, but to engage us in a discussion of those important matters. You know, you put the politics aside, history is pretty interesting. You look at those two individuals, their impact on so many things in America, and here they are at purposes again, this time, Breyer giving a heads up, apparently, to the world, so that President Biden might pick his replacement. Now, all of this, has, as mentioned, has gotten hotter and hotter as the Washington politics have changed. And when I did get to talk to Justice Breyer as a reporter, I asked him about how you deal with those politically pointed questions from senators in the confirmation process. The senators are going to reflect what you want. So you better stop it. And the way you stop it is when you disagree with somebody, you talk to them about it. You talk to them about it. You try to convince them. You participate. You vote. And uh, you do it yourself. An almost old-fashioned idea of how to deal with senators. That was in one of the interviews I mentioned, Breyer talking about the questions. Now, he would ultimately find himself ruling on some of the most important and pressing controversies in America. It was Breyer who wrote the majority ruling upholding Obamacare, which was challenged several times. This was a series of rulings that continued to reinforce Obama's signature health care law. Today's decision was a victory for people all over this country whose lives will be more secure because of this law and the Supreme Court's decision to uphold it. When you talk about that decision to uphold it and what's changing on the court, on the substance, that's part of what the court will lose with Breyer retiring. And the question is, who will replace him? And would they have similar views about federal power and health care as we go through this pandemic? Breyer was also on the losing side of certain issues in a left of center minority. There was a 2004 ruling on partisan gerrymandering, something that so many people have talked about, Rachel, on our air for years, how this can undermine democracy. 
The court basically didn't want to get super involved, and Breyer disagreed, saying democracy was at stake and that purely political gerrymandering can fail to advance any plausible democratic objective and threaten serious democratic harm. Like Ginsburg and Scalia on other issues, that was how he would advocate, writing not only for the day but for history to perhaps turn that dissent into a majority. Now, Breyer was in the majority on other voting cases. He wrote a closely divided opinion on the winning side, five to four, stopping Alabama from what would basically dilute the lawful power of black voters in the state. Now, going back to the interview we did just about two years ago, I asked him something that I actually wonder about as someone who's studied the law and reports on the law, which is, how do you do these rulings where politics is the whole story and you know it's going to benefit a political side no matter what you do? How do you stay above that political fray ruling in these kind of cases? We stay out of politics. And really, sometimes it's very hard to just stay out. But the more the political fray is uh, hot and intense and so forth, the more it's we stay out of it. And of course, we have to stay out of it because the decisions we're making are decisions for 330 million Americans. Fact check true. The justices are some of the least scrutinized and least covered members of the federal government. We don't even get cameras in their courtrooms, even though that's how a lot of people learn about what's happening in the world or videos that you take in a courtroom and put on the Internet. Either way, that's not even allowed. And yet it's not just 330 million Americans governed by things like the health care ruling. It's also life and death. We are a country rare among civilized democracies that still executes our own citizens. And the death penalty, as I've reported repeatedly on this program, has proven to be biased against poor people and black and brown people. I could tell you Justice Breyer was someone who clearly cared about that. And he was losing these cases, meaning he was writing in the minority in those dissents about exactly what's wrong, he said, with the American death penalty. In 2015, he wrote that it likely constitutes a legally prohibited, cruel, and unusual punishment. This was a jurist who, whatever else you thought of him, cared deeply about that obligation. All those appeals that go up to the Supreme Court where people would say, not only was this case wrong or a miscarriage of justice or someone might be innocent, but someone might be innocent and about to be executed in our name by our government. Now, when you get back to where we're headed, of course, like any reporter, nothing special about this question, you got to ask a justice, especially as they get on in years, about their thoughts on potential successors. This was an area where he clearly demurred. That is a political process insofar as nominating and confirming the judge is concerned. And so asking me about that process, it's like asking for the recipe for chicken a la king from the point of view of the chicken. Now, just like for TV hosts, it's a lower bar for uh, humor from Supreme Court justices. That's his bon mot that he sees himself as like the chicken. Don't ask me the chicken about the recipe. Go talk to the chef. Well, that's really where we are. These are people, these nine justices who, yield, who wield such huge powers. And the question is, any time you have one of these vacancies, who should have that lifetime appointment? Remember, nobody else has a lifetime appointment in the other branches, Congress, Senate, President, of course. Who should get the lifetime power? And what do we want to do on that process? So we think about what Breyer did, but also where we're headed. And as part of our special coverage, I can tell you I'm going to fit in a quick break. And next, we have an acclaimed Supreme Court reporter and a Breyerologist. Stay with us.